Welcome to the Sponsored Rider Club Podcast, your guide to motorsport sponsorship. Here's your host, Josh Weesey. Welcome to episode 55 of the Sponsored Rider Club Podcast, which is powered by ImpactFuel.org. My name is Josh Weesey. I'm your host. I'm here to guide you through this wild world of motorsports sponsorship. To help me with that today, we have our featured guest, the owner of Stud Boy Traction, Ron Patton. Now, before we get into the interview with Ron, I have a couple things to cover with you. First off, I'd love to get your feedback and show iTunes World that we're serious over here with this podcast. So please head over to iTunes and leave a rating and review. I also like to read off some of the reviews. And this one comes from Snowmobile Baby, uh, specifically the owner, Lisa Krug. I love the niche of this podcast, Phil's, in the motorsports industry. Working on Snowmobile Baby and being a relatively new brand in the snowmobile market, I can't get enough business tips, ideas, and advice from others who have blazed trails and had success in this industry. So there's a little bit more to that review as well, but it would be fantastic if you could go and contribute to that. In the future, I will read that review on this show. Now, next thing I want to discuss is subscribing. So I don't care what podcast player you are on. Go ahead and hit subscribe so you don't miss our upcoming guests. Now, our next one is going to be Josh Martelli of Mad Media. Beyond that, we're going to have Tiffany Stone of Torque, followed by an off-road racer and marketing genius, Jim Riley. Now, if you want to get some insider access and upcoming guests and just have a general forum where you can share best practices around sponsorship, go ahead and search the Sponsored Rider Club on Facebook and request to join. If you have any questions or guest recommendations, shoot me an email, podcast at impactfuel.org. Now, this episode is brought to you by four awesome companies. Solderweld, they produce game-changing metal bonding technology products. We have Neverlift Racing, specifically the Armor Coat product line. And if you want to get 10% off your next order, go ahead and use promo code ARMOR10 at armorcoatproducts.com. Coat is spelled K-O-T-E. Then we have toptopodium.com. They are experts in motorsports sponsorship. And then Bold Racing and Suspension, their family race team and custom suspension experts. Now, the structure of this podcast is set up like a race. We begin with the qualifier, which is a basic introduction. And then Heat 1, we'll discuss Ron's background, and we'll learn a little bit about actually how he started Stud Boy Traction. And Heat 2, we'll discuss some sponsorship tactics and strategies, specifically what Ron is looking for out of a sponsorship. And then in the main event, we'll discuss mindset, and then we'll end at the finish line. We'll get some closing comments and contact information. Without further ado, let's hop in. Welcome, everybody, to this episode of the Sponsored Rider Club Podcast. Today, we have Ron Patton here from Stud Boy Traction, and together we're going to guide you through the complexities of motorsports sponsorship. To get started, though, Ron, go ahead and kick us off with an intro about yourself. You know, again, my name is Ron Patton. I'm uh, with Stud Boy Traction Products. We've been doing this for quite some time, and uh, we... uh, (laughs) We're, we're pretty active in the industry, both from a manufacturing standpoint and, and racing as well. So uh, I was kind of flattered to have you guys give us a holler and see if we participate today. Yeah, I really appreciate you coming on. You know, for people that don't know, Ron and I actually met up at the Novi Michigan Snow Show. We were chatting a little bit about studs and traction products. And, uh, you know, I was like, hey, why don't, why don't we set this up in the future where, you can, where Ron can get on the show and share some of his experiences. So that's really ultimately what got us here to this moment right now um well cool the the thing i want to do first off in heat one is dive into your background i really want to understand more about your story i want to understand your journey and you know i want to know about stud boy uh specifically so first off though going back to to the the roots here when did you actually get into the motorsports industry and you know how did that happen you know, we actually uh, incorporated Stud Boy or Liberty Products back in 1989, and at that time, I was still working for Lazy Boy Chair Company. I'd mm. been in various manufacturing capacities, and uh, I was running three plants for those guys at the time, and uh, we, uh, you know, we were very avid snowmobilers, both in uh, the trail, aggressive trail riding and some racing, and uh Every year we uh, we got together and had a big stud party, and all of our all of the guys would you know show up in somebody's pole barn, and we'd have our traction products, you know, skis up or you know runners up front, studs in the back, the 
the wives and girlfriends would send over a potluck and we'd kind of do a production line assembly to get, you know, get the crews, uh, studs, you know, and studs studded up and ready to go. And as we continue to do that, we all kind of had some manufacturing and engineering backgrounds. We said, you know, you know, we can, we can make some product like this. And there was some, you know, some room for improvement in certain areas. And there was years that it was very difficult to find a product. And, uh, if we weren't uh, Johnny on a spot to get it early, people ran out. So we we decided that uh, we thought we maybe want to do this, and and we made our first couple trial batches. And because there were some shortages in the industry, a couple of local dealers uh, snapped you know the first forty fifty thousand pieces we made up in a heartbeat, and uh, it kind of helped us develop the product and and you know get our foot wet uh, into the industry here. Oh, that's pretty cool. I especially. For me to listen to that story, for people that don't know, and my day job is a manufacturing engineering manager, so I know a little bit about some of the things that the manufacturing engineers think about and how their brain works. So that's really cool that you were able to take a problem in the industry and use your past experience and leverage that to to come up with a, a long-standing business. Now, I mean, that's what shoot almost 30 years now, so. Yeah, we kind of started in '89 there, and really, uh, I, I hung up my, uh, my 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 gave my notice to Lazy Boy in '92, and that's when things really kind of took off for us. And uh, it was pretty explosive growth right at first, so uh, we worked very hard. But it was something we really loved to do, and uh, and it's it's been good. It's been uh, been a been a pretty long run, but it's been pretty darn good along the way. Oh, it's very good, very good. So. What else happened along that path? Like maybe when did you get into sponsorship and, you know, supporting race programs? You know, it uh, it was kind of an interesting story there. We wanted to start local. So we uh, we contacted some of the more prevalent, uh, you know, grass drag and ice ovals and enduro circuits early on. And because we have a very strong competitor here in the Michigan area as well, most of those guys weren't really interested in working with us. Uh, being a new kid on the block and, and kind of relatively unheard of. And uh, so we kind of ventured out to other areas and, and started working with uh, various race circuits. And as, as we got hooked up with some of those race circuits, the racers started following suit. And uh, some of the early, early guys that we worked with was Team Alpine here back in, in, in Grand Rapids. Uh, they had a pretty solid grass, you know, grass team. And, uh, D and D out of Lawville, New York, was another one of our early racers, and uh, from there it just kind of continued to grow. We uh, we we worked very hard. You know, it wasn't long after that that snowcross became extremely popular, and that uh, that is kind of where we really focused for a while there in cross country. And we've had a lot of fun. Most uh, most of those early racers are still very good friends with us today, and. Uh, it's it's you know you build some pretty long term relationships uh, with these people and uh, and it's it's been great. Uh, that's cool and D and D racing you know they're still they're still kicking it right now. I mean I follow them on social media too and message them back and forth from time to time and they make some really good products. I had my last sled was kind of decked out in uh, you know D and D performance products and I had stud boy studs and you know wear bars and things like that. And, uh, yeah, together, D&D and Subway, they do a pretty good job of, uh, you know, making making sleds rocket. You know, we've had fun with those guys. We still work with them on a regular basis. And, you know, they use our products and we use theirs. And uh, it's, uh, it's been since, I think, 93 since we started working with uh, Dan and Dale out there. Mm-hmm. And they were, ex- ex- extremely competitive in grass. And, Kind of interesting, but Dale's son jo- or Dylan now, besides you know being a pretty uh, heavy hitter in the, in the grass drag series, he's doing snowcross as well now, mm-hmm. and uh, so it's been kind of a fun journey with those guys for sure. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, well, that's good. That's a cool, cool background. Um, what about today? I mean, tell us a little bit about what Stud Boy is all about today. You know, we've uh, we've tried very hard to. to you know, be a vertically integrated manufacturer. We we take shipping, you know, very you know, very seriously. We want to ship on time and complete. Keep our uh, our customers, uh, you know, filled with uh, with our product as they desire. 
And we've worked, you know, our, our method of sales has typically been three-tier distribution where we sell to the larger wholesalers like the Parts Unlimited, Western Power Sports, Kimpexes, Gammas, those type of people who pass it on to the dealers and ultimately at the consumer. And from a racer side of things, we have a racer support program that uh, we try to help guys from the, you know, from the biggest names of the sport down to the guys that are just getting started, uh, you know, and, uh, and, and getting their you know feet wet in racing. So, uh, so, you know, racing is, you know, one of the other ways that we sell product, but also, you know, provide some large sponsorship with, with very accomplished racers. And, uh, and it's good for the business. We we use our sponsorship uh, program to you know give and receive input. Um, our racers have helped us along the ways. You know, kind of bulletproof our products and, and brainstorm different ideas with us. So we really like to interact with racers because we feel that it helps us make a better product. Oh, that's good. We've talked about this topic a little bit. I I know we hit on it in episode 26 of the show with Jared Heshka of MBRP, where he was saying. That was actually one of the main reasons why they sponsored a certain snowcross program was purely from the R&D perspective so that they could take a, a, a trail can or a race can, get it out there, let them race with it, and come back and give feedback, tweak this, change that. And I think that's interesting. Honestly, before I started this whole podcast thing, I never really thought about that aspect of what a sponsorship program can bring you know, from an R&D standpoint. Well, it's pretty important, you know. I mean, when when we're racing, especially the top level of the sport, we're, everybody's always looking for that next little edge because it's extremely competitive. And to have you know a bunch of minds working on a, a product that uh, that we're using uh, certainly helps. I mean, we don't always take all the input, but uh, but there's times that you know it makes a ton of sense. And uh, it's all about product development and and given. Uh, giving the products to the, to the guys that are pushing it harder than anybody else to help them win. Yeah, definitely. Well, that's awesome. Um, I plan on digging a lot more into the sponsorship program here in a minute, but I just want to take a second to thank the sponsors for this podcast. Sounds good. I want you to think long and hard about this next question. Where do you think you should be spending your time at? Should it be on developing a sponsorship program? Or should it be on cleaning the mud and dirt and filth and grime off your machine? I'm hoping that the answer you're thinking in your head is that you'd like to spend it on your sponsorship program. That's why you're listening to this podcast, and that's where you should be focusing your off-the-track time. But sometimes that mud and grime and whatever, it's there, and you got to get it off your machine, right? And that's actually why I want to talk to you next about Armor Coat brought to you by never lift racing company so armor coat products help prevent mud clay ice all that other garbage stuff from sticking to your machine and ultimately it ends up cutting your cleanup time in half and i mean your machine looks great leaves uh essentially a water resistant shine helps fight corrosion and you can use it on like multiple services so it's ultimately fantastic and and really the purpose of this product like i said before is to make the racer's life easier now if this at all intrigues you i want you to check out armor coat at armorcoatproducts.com coat is spelled with a k and when you get there use promo code armor10 to get 10 percent off the products I hear it constantly from racers that a good suspension setup is absolutely critical for performance. And that's why I'm going to talk to you next about bold racing and suspension. Now, it's really critical to understand your suspension. And there's so many intricacies with the valving and the the shims and all this crazy equipment that you need to actually you know, rebuild and properly set up your suspension, that it's really important if you're ready for that next level of, of performance to partner with an awesome suspension company. Now, Bold Racing is that company. They're not only specialists with their suspension setups, but they also partner with companies that produce amazing custom components. And on top of that, they're a family race team. They actually race themselves, so they really understand the type of beating that your vehicle 
and your shocks can take. So what I want you to do is give them a call and just chat with them. Talk to them about suspension. Their number is 702-506-5354. If you're not ready for a phone call, go ahead and shoot them an email, bold.racing at yahoo.com. Have you ever been out on the trail or at the track or in the middle of the desert and something breaks? Well, of course you have. We've all been there. But a lot of people at that point, they reach into their trusty toolbox for the duct tape or the zip ties or wrenches to fix their machine. However, there's a feeling that you get when you realize you need more than just duct tape to fix that rock chip in your radiator. That's a horrible, horrible feeling to have. And that's why I'm going to tell you next about solder welds metal bonding products specifically alloy saw so this product gives you a longer term fix than jb weld which is just going to get you back to the trailer or back to the pits with basically the assistance of map gas or propane torch you can quickly and easily repair an oil cooler radiator ac line or any crack or hole in aluminum and better yet alloy soil flux is the only flux in industry that cleans and decontaminates the dirty and greasy surface for you so you don't even have to worry about that part the alloy sole rods are actually capable of a 30,000 psi fix and they're stronger than even the parent metal and they're built to last the lifetime of the part so don't let a simple radiator leak leave you out of the race or broken down in the trail bring along some alloy sole aluminum alloy repair rod and flux from solder weld i am constantly asking the guests of this podcast how they attract and retain sponsors and on almost every single occasion somebody gives an example of a resume a rider or a racer resume is extremely important to your overall sponsorship pitch and proposal and it's tough to do i mean it's not really the easiest thing Anybody can go through and put together a resume, so don't get me wrong there, but it's really difficult to get something that's like unique and different and stands out, and that also is something that can be put across multiple platforms. Well, that's one of the things that I want to talk to you about next is how TopThePodium.com can actually help you build a race or rider resume that can be used on multiple platforms. I'm talking like website, PDF, you know, something you can print off. That's interactive, that looks fantastic, it looks absolutely professional. Well, that's because it's made by a professional. This is the type of thing that's going to set you apart from the crowd and that's going to position you for a strong sponsorship proposal. So what I want you to do next is go to topthepodium.com. And if you have a question, there's a little chat icon that pops up on the side of the screen when you go to topthepodium.com. And you can go ahead and type... Your question right there, Jeff Vanistall, he is the owner of Top the Podium. He's going to be able to respond to you directly, so check it out. All right, well, welcome back, everybody. We are now in Heat 2, and that's where we dive into the, really the details, the nitty-gritty stuff around sponsorship tactics and strategies. So, Ron, I kind of want to talk first, though, before we really get into the sponsorship stuff, I want to take just a minute to to discuss your specialty, some, you know, snowmobile traction products. So what are some of the things that riders and racers, people listening right now, what, what should they consider when they're choosing studs or wear bars? You know, um, obviously use a high quality product from a well-respected manufacturer is very important. And, you know, racers have a tendency to look for the, the latest and most innovative products in the marketplace to see if it's going to help them, uh, you know, achieve their goals in the racetrack. So, from a stud boy perspective, you know, we've, uh, you know, we've tried to, to, to give them what they want. Um, in the front of the snowmobile with, uh, with our, you know, wear bars, we offer the shaper bar, which is, pro- you know, the, the, undisputedly the most aggressive turning wear bar on the snow today. It's got a concave uh, profile on each side of that bar, so it really holds snow and keeps that ski planted and tightens up your turning radiuses. And that's a, you know, it's a patented item, and... Uh, but again, it's it's leading edge. Most most wear bars do a very good job of, of of just that. They protect the ski from wear and tear. Um, but we also like to add a little bit extra to it from a you know from a handling perspective. Mm-hmm. On the back side of the sled, uh, another pretty innovative product that you find only a stud boy are our Pro Series backers. 
They are a one-piece uh, polymer, you know, molded product that, uh, in, you know, in, in integrates the support nuts, uh, attraction, uh, you know, rib or bar, lug, and, uh, and a backer plate. And being one-piece construction is a very solid and rigid, you know, mounted product for your stud. And it's very gentle and easy on your track as well and offers, you know, superior traction with very light weight. And, uh, so that's, you know, definitely a racer's, you know, best friend. Lightweight is always important, especially if it's uh, durable enough to get you, get the job done, which we aim for every time. I've never run the, uh, the fancy backers in the past. I've always just had flat ones. And, uh, I think my next, my next move is going to be going to the, you know, the fancy backers. You know, they, uh, they make a lot of sense. Uh, and you know, at the first time you use them, it's a new, uh, new kind of a new experience for installation. But once you get the hang of it, uh, most people would never want to go back to a multi-piece uh, backer support nut combination because the Pro Series are are very easy to install. But they 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 do a super job. And uh, again, it's kind of the latest and greatest in, in in traction products as far as backer plates are concerned. And uh, and they work very well. You show up at a you know ISOC National Snowcross race. You know, 80% of the sleds are running them. And uh, they get the job done there very well from both acceleration and braking. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. What's the guidance on uh, how many studs you put in uh, to a track? I, I've heard like one stud per horsepower in the past, but I mean, is there is there any validity to that? You know, typically in snowcross type racing, there's a limit of uh, of 96 studs that are allowed. Okay. But in other disciplines, it's it's wide open um, and from a trail racing perspective or trail, you know, riding perspective, you're right. A minimum of one stud for horsepower is our recommended if you're studying just the center portion of the track. Mm-hmm. If you decide to kind of go old school and still stud the outside for a little bit more aggressive handling, we like to recommend up to like one and a half studs per horsepower because the outside edge of the track is by far and away the most vulnerable from a, from a damage standpoint. And mm-hmm. uh, so, so you had a few studs there and you know, some of the sprint guys and you know ice ovals they're running well over 400 studs at times Whoa. and uh, so yeah they get stuck pretty good to the ice that way but uh so there's a big variance depending on you know how you're how you're actually using the product and uh, what discipline you're using it in geez 400 studs i can't even like comprehend that that's just i don't even know where you put them all at yeah and they're those have you know those are 30 degree tips uh very aggressive, uh, you know, and very sharp uh, steel studs, and they they're like almost like Velcro to the ice. But those guys still break them loose and and slide through the turns at Eagle River uh, when they're chasing that World Championship every year. It's amazing to watch them pitch a sled in there with 400 and some, you know, razor sharp picks in the track. Right. Wow. That's amazing. That really is. <laughs> well, cool. Um. Yeah, I've, I always feel like it's a it's a struggle to determine the exact right amount of of studs you want. I mean, it sounds like for snowcross there's some regulation there, but I know for trail riding, that's something I've always gone back and forth on. It's like, well, I, I don't want to go too much, and then you know, risk like putting things on the outside, like you're saying, and reduce some of the, or at least increase the opportunity for wear on the outside edges. But, I go too little, then I'm going to lose to my friends in a race, and I don't want to do that because that's unacceptable. And uh, I always go back and forth on that for sure. Well, you know, a lot of it's personal preference as far as how you know how well you want that sled to be stuck to the trail. But uh, durability comes into mind, obviously, as we talked about uh, some minimum recommendations. But also, it's important to balance the front end and the, and the rear of the snowmobile. Mm-hmm. You know, if a guy is not running studs or very minimal studs, he doesn't want to throw on a set of nine-inch shaper bars or competition-style bars up front. Uh, it would definitely be in an oversteer condition. So it is important to balance the front and rear of your snowmobile from a handling standpoint. And most of the real aggressive guys on the trails, they still kind of like to really stick that front end so that uh, – when they you know, when they point it the way they want it to go, it does it, it does respond and go that way for them. But uh, we've seen a trend over the last several years with the deeper lug tracks and whatnot that uh, people are studying a little bit less as far as, as quantity goes. Um, 
within reason, but uh, and especially they're staying off the outside edge for probably 80% of the trail applications. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, for my sled that I just picked up, it's a cross track uh, 9,000 Arctic Cat, and it's got a one and a half inch Cobra track on it. So that's I was kind of thinking that I would stay to the inside and uh, you know go with maybe a little bit less studs than what I've done in the past. You know, again, that's a pretty peppy sled, <laughs> and uh, you know, it's a, is it a is it a brand new you know, 2018? Ah, uh, it's a 16, 2016. So it's got the okay, Suzuki motor, 177 horsepower with the turbo. Yeah, so you're gonna you know you're gonna probably gonna want to look at at least three to four studs per log in the center of your track just to, just to keep your track healthy. You know, if you decide right. to use that right hand, uh, you know, at times. Uh, <laughs> and I will be. <laughs> oh yeah. You know, to get some of that track longevity out of there, uh, it's important to, to not scrimp on studs too much. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Uh, well, that's good, man. Good good advice. What about uh, wear? Like, I mean, how do you know when it's time to replace your studs? I mean, your wear bars, I think that's a little bit more obvious. You can tell the wear, but, like, how do you know when it's time to get get your studs replaced? You know, the, the carbide inserts in our studs are about three-eighths of an inch long. And... Uh, you know, studs typically wear by the, the steel that holds that carbide, you know, pin in place. Mm -hmm. Typically, you know, especially in poor conditions, wears around that carbide pin, and the carbide pin will eventually break off and kind of go down to a flush level or slightly recessed with that uh, with that steel again. And obviously, the, the better conditions you ride in, the longer your traction products last. But if you start seeing, uh, you know, erosion in that stud, you know, down three or an inch from the original height, more than likely it's going to be pretty close to the top of your track lug because for most applications, we do recommend three eighths of an inch above the lug. So if you're getting close to the top of your lug in your track or you're seeing lots of bending and whatnot, uh, it's, it's, it's definitely time to replace them. And, and bending is another good indication. If you're seeing studs bending in your, in, in your the way you ride, that's a pretty good sign that we probably need to add a few more studs in there. Ah, yeah, you know, the that few, makes sense. Yeah, the fewer studs you have, it's kind of like a bed of nails. Uh, you know, you know, the fewer you have, they're going to penetrate deeper. And of course, you put the, you know, put the, the rotation from the track and the power to the ground uh, with that deeper penetration and few studs. That the the, secu the place you secure it is obviously the rubber track. And it makes it pretty darn vulnerable to uh, to tear outs and whatnot. So if you're seeing a lot of bending, pretty good sign we ought to add a few studs in there before we start seeing some problems. Oh, that's good. That's good. That's awesome. Appreciate the tips, uh, it, at least for me. Maybe I'm being selfish here and trying to learn a few things uh, about about traction products. But what people are here to, to listen to is definitely information about sponsorship stuff. So Next thing I want to talk about is that, uh, first off, I mean, what are the things that you, Ron, are, what are you looking for out of a brand ambassador? Exactly that. We, we want an ambassador that uh, represents not only our product line well, you know, but also our sport. And, uh, you know, why it's nice to get a guy that wins every weekend and, and sits on top of the podium, that's great. But we're also looking for that guy that, that goes the extra mile to, to give our sport a good reputation be willing to help others and, and help the sport grow that way. Um, winning, winning is good, but being a really good all around person and, uh, helping things out is, is really the most important thing we look for. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. This is always an interesting topic because that's actually a pretty common response, right? There's, there's, uh, obviously some benefits to someone get on a podium. There's a lot of exposure when you're winning a lot, you know, your name becomes a lot more well-known, but there's, especially with social media, there's a lot of opportunities now for you to become well-known without necessarily being on the podium all the time. So around someone being like perceived as a generally good person, I mean, what are some of the things that you look for them to do? Like what, what do you see people do that you feel like makes them, you know, classifies them as a, a potential for your program? You know, as you mentioned, social media is great. You know, getting the name out there, that's what this is about is, you know, sponsorship is another form of advertising and obviously product development. So so getting the word out in a positive manner is very important, whether it be with, you know, updated emails, public appearances, social media, which is pretty much instant. Um, 
But beyond all that, we'd like to see a guy that's approachable in a pitch with his fan base or even his competitors. You know, if a guy needs to borrow a tool or some parts, you know, we don't want that guy that's you know very selfish and self-centered and only takes care of himself or his team. We, uh, we, you know, we only want to be enemies on the start line. The rest of the time, we want to be friends and good people. And and that's what race is all about. There's a lot of uh, a lot of friendship there and lots and lots of great relationships that we've had over the years in all types of racing. And, and that's what it's, you know, being a good person, all of, that's what it's, that's what it comes down to. Yeah, that's awesome. I have a example I want to pull out from experience I had in, in earlier in this year, this is 2017 for people listening. And I went to the Vegas Torino off-road race, uh, best in the desert race with, Jimmy Moore of Bold Racing. He's one of the sponsors for this podcast. I went out there with him, and I got to see that firsthand in the pits. Uh, so the way that that race works is, you know, you, you'll begin at the start line, and then uh, the racer will go to various pits. I think in this case there was like 14, and you have a chase crew that uh, follows behind them and, uh, you know, tries to uh, get everything set up where the car comes in. You, you do whatever maintenance you need to do, and they get right out. Well, sometimes things don't go as planned, and I was very impressed with seeing other racers and their pit crew helping teams out that needed it. Uh, you know, if someone was struggling with a part or trying to fix something, you would see multiple people come over. I know Jimmy uh, came into one of the stops, and he had an issue, so we were working on that issue, and another team came over. I wish I could remember which team it was, but another team came over and they did all the, the random checks that we weren't doing at that time. So they came and basically you, you shake down all the parts and make sure that there's no issues. They came over and did that while we were fixing his other issue, which saved us, you know, probably five minutes of overall pit time, which is phenomenal. And I saw people um, throughout the entire, I don't know, I think I can't remember really how, I think we raced like 17 hours or something. At every pit, I felt like we saw some example of that. So it's really cool, um, you know, to, to hear that. And I'm glad that's something that you look for as well. You know, that's like you say, it's very important. Uh, you know, you don't want a person out there or a team that uh, that nobody likes, you know, repping your product. I mean, everybody's competitive. We're all doing this. It starts as fun and it turns into a pretty serious game when you get up to, you know, up, up, you know, in the upper echelons of race, the racing world. But again, uh, you, you, at the end of the day, we're looking for people that help us, you know, build a brand and sell product. And and and, and remember that it's always a two-way street. I mean, sponsorship goes both ways. I mean, we're we're doing this to get some additional exposure and whatnot, and be active in the sport. But at the same time, you know, we want that feedback and and that uh, you know the ability to broadcast. Uh, our product and our, and our brand out to the, to the, you know, to, to the, whether it be a local neighborhood with a sport rider and a beginning uh, grassroots series, or, you know, it's, you know, at the big, you know, with all the big names in the, in, in the pits at, uh, and, uh, you know, I stock national, for example. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Oh, that's good. So another thing that people ask me about a lot, and that people struggle with in general is making contact with the sponsor. They're not exactly sure where to start at. I mean, do they start with emails? Do they start with going to an event? I, what What would you say is a good way to make that initial contact with a potential sponsor? You know, we receive uh, that contact several ways. Sometimes it's face to face at a in an event. You know, whether it be a snow show or or you know at, at a race event. Or uh, quite often we try to make it relatively easy. We have a form on our on our website that's for you know an application for racer support, and it makes it easy for those beginning racers that are you know that are running some of the grassroots circuits and whatnot to fill out a form. You know what their plans are, what what their experience has been. You know, you know what you know what they're going to do for the season, what their needs are, and uh, they can hit the submit button. It comes right into us, and we can we can work with them. Now we ask those guys to. You know, be running a bona fide circuit and, uh, and and really, you know, have a need for some help uh, to get started because most of those guys are on a shoestring budget, so we're willing to help uh, with some pretty substantial discounts on them. Um, as we go up the ladder with a lot of guys, we we get some pretty formal presentations and and you know in resumes and 
and packages that come through the mail to us and, and even emailed. But uh, those are the most common ways. Um, what we don't like, uh, you know, one of the things we talked about, the positive of social media um, with, uh, with getting the word out there and, and how we're doing in both racing and our brands. We don't really let the guy that, you know, shows up on Facebook Messenger and says, hey, I need sponsorship. This is my number. Tell me what you're going to do for me. That just mm-hmm. doesn't really fly very well in our world. And, uh, and and we see more of that than we'd like. Yeah, it's incredible sometimes. Even even with me, uh, you know, I've got a small business called Impact Fuel. And it's in no way, shape, or form structured for sponsorship. It's not something I've, I've, I've sought out either. But people reach out. Even honestly, even with this podcast, people reach out like, what are you going to do to sponsor me? Uh, uh, what? That's... I, I don't even know if that's – are you a real person talking to me right now? Like, what? it's so crazy. Uh, so I'm, I'm glad you brought that up, and I know people who are listening right now, there's got to be at least one person that's done that before. And I, what I'll say to you is it, it's okay. Just change your ways, you know, approach the conversation a little bit differently. So uh, with that said, though, Ron, like let's say uh, – let's give two two comparisons. What's one where someone contacted you and, the, and you said, absolutely not? And then what's one where they contacted you and it was good? Like what was – what would be the, – what's the difference between those two, whether it's an email or a direct message or whatever? You know, like you say, probably the some of the worst ones we've had have been, you know, a direct, you know, mail or a message and, and something on Facebook Messenger with without an introduction, without really a lot about their background. We don't really know the person. And they, they stick their hand out and, and – want to know their deal instantly without putting any effort or professionalism into their approach. And, uh, and that, that makes it pretty tough to take seriously. And you know, we don't, we don't want to alienate anybody, but we'd like just a little bit of effort to, you know, if we can't make an effort when we're trying to make the first approach, we're probably not going to get much of an effort uh, from that person if we decide to help them as well. And uh, right. so we kind of kick those guys to the curb a little bit. Um, some of them, you know, more impressive uh, resumes come in. We don't want them. We don't want them to be a book. You know, we don't need 30 pages of, of resume. We're all we all got business to run and manufacturing facilities to run, and we all wear a lot of hats and we're busy. So as much as we like to, you know, let's like see it. We'd like something that's, you know, professional. You know, short, concise, to the point. Gets the job done. Gives us some contact information on how to how to get with you. Maybe some expectations of of, you know, what that person is looking for and how we can help. Maybe know a little bit about our product before they, before they ask, you know, know some of the, you know, some of the you know, performance benefits of our product and let us know why they want to use our product versus some of our competition. And people to do a little research up front and understand the business uh, and maybe even what our, you know, capabilities are, it makes a bigger impact in us when we decide to help. Yeah, that's a good point uh, that you brought up around knowing a little bit about the benefits of the product and why you'd actually want to have that product over something else. I'm thinking back to job interviewing, right? I mean, what I do in my, my day job is I'm a hiring manager, so I interview people. And if I, uh, if someone approaches me and doesn't know about my company or the benefits that my company brings uh, at like a job fair or something, that's that resume is most likely going into the discard pile. Like there, there needs to be, uh, some passion, some evident research, some, I don't know, understanding of of what my company provides. So I think that it, I'm glad you said that here because it, it really makes sense from a, a business sponsorship standpoint that the rider racer should have a good understanding of the product and, and that's why they're contacting you, right? Not just for some other some discounted product, some free product, they should have some real reason behind it too. Well, I would hope so. I mean, if they put some, we'd like to see that they put a little effort into their attempt for some sponsorship. We, that same effort probably is going to work into how they're going to promote our brand and the effort they're going to put on the racetrack as well. And uh, if they, if they don't want to take the time to understand why they want to use our products or a little bit about us, uh, Especially in today's world, information is very readily available. It, it, you know, it, just a little bit of work goes a long ways in trying to to get some help back. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You had mentioned that 
and some of your better proposals that there's a you receive some package or something in the mail. What do you mean by that? What kind of like materials do you receive in the mail from a good proposal? You know, we uh, we get anywhere from you know D- DVDs, you know, flash drives, you know, printed you know you know proposals. We've got hard copied you know booklets that have been sent to us. There's been a lot of different things sent our way, but but a nice short you know two to three page resume is enough to break the ice. You know, throw some good photos on there. You know, a, a nice face shot, a little bit about you, the team, you know, where you're going to race, what what accomplishments you've had, what your goals are. I mean, and, and again, why a nice book that's pretty impressive and great. Uh, we, it's, it's sometimes hard to sift through a lot of that stuff. So we'd like something that, you know, kind of helps us get to the point rather, you know, pretty quickly. And, uh, and then we reach out back as well to, to find out more or, of what may be missing or, was perked our interest a little bit. That's a good point in how, you know, you don't want to overload information. Um, you know, it's probably good for people to think about maybe a staged approach, meaning, you know, stage one is the eye catching, the interest catching option. And then maybe you follow that up with some of your more detailed information and, you know, or a phone call or a, you know, face to face chat or whatever it may be. So, yeah, that that's good, you know, uh, to bring that up because yeah, you're trying to run a business and you know some companies they get hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of these proposals um, and they're not gonna have time to sift sift through the really big packets either. And you know, I've been guilty at times to be honest with you. If I've got a nice uh, presentation on a DVD that's sent to me and there's not much else with it besides a little note that says, "Hey, I'm so and so, take a look at my DVD." There's a lot of times I'm pretty darn busy. A little, you know, a three-piece uh, or a three-page, four-page resume that I can flip through there works pretty easy. But, you know, I've had some DVDs show up, you know, 35, 40 minutes long. And uh, mm. it's hard hard for me to block out a part of my day to get that done. And I, with all the best intentions in the world, I set it aside to get back to it later. And a lot of times that just doesn't happen. And, yeah, uh, yeah so we, like you say, we got to get to the point pretty quick here a little you know a little bit of you know effort with a with a professional looking you know application or resume and uh that that gets us to stage two for sure good good i like that so let's talk a little bit more about social media because it's still fairly new i mean social media has been around but i think it's still fairly new And I don't know if we've really mastered it yet. I mean, I think there's some people that are doing fantastic work on social media and there's some people, even, even myself, I would consider myself as someone who just hasn't quite fully grasped all of the capabilities of social media. But ultimately what I want to understand from you is what role does that really play in sponsorship? And we talked about it earlier some, but from your business perspective, what, what role does it play? You know, it's important. Everybody's carrying around a cell phone, you know, smartphone today. And, you know, the current trend is people want instant information. Nobody wants to wait for anything. So getting some, you know, positive posts out there and some updates on how things are going at the racetrack are, are really cool. And, uh, you know, it's it's a good thing. Um, social media, just like a job interview, you know, you know, athletes got to kind of remember, race teams got to kind of remember that, you uh, you know, you talked about uh, a little research goes a long ways in a job interview. Well, social media can be pretty damaging to a guy, too, because if they uh, show them and four of their buddies or their, or their team, you know, passed out on the couch or the floor and, <laughs> and a bunch of party remains left over laying besides them, that's not going to go very far when their next, mm-hmm. you know, next you know, post is how great they did at XYZ Racetrack over the weekend. And uh, so... A couple of companies out there, like I know Polaris, for example, is doing a great job of having a, a little, you know, social media training session with their athletes every year to kind of help them get to the good side of what social media can do with us and kind of prevent uh, the bad stuff as well. Yeah, I like that. Um, I can't remember who it was. Someone else that was on the show 
they were one of the players brand ambassadors. I can't remember if it was Travis Pointer or Matt Entz or something. They talked about that uh, that program. It's pretty cool. Like they, you know, like I think you said it too. Every year they'll give them a refresher. You know, they give them some tips on how to better market themselves. I think really my ultimate point in talking about this stuff is to say that it's really not quite as straightforward as you might think. Uh, I mean, if you're just using social media to share your thoughts and ideas, then fine. I think it's pretty straightforward. You do what you want. But if you're trying to build a brand or, you know, promote a business or, you know, earn revenue, whatever it may be, I think it gets a little bit more complicated than just getting your, what you're thinking out there. Exactly. And, you know, like anything else, uh, sometimes our, our fingers move faster than, uh, than what they probably should. And it's pretty hard to retract stuff later once it gets out there. So yeah. being, uh, you know, taking a few minutes to think about what you want to say and what you, you know, how people want to perceive you, um, and, and what your, you know, your accomplishments are and, uh, and, and the message you're trying to send is pretty darn important in today's world. Definitely, definitely. Well, outside of social media, what are some other things that, that come to mind that racer, racers and riders can do? Um, you know, you talked a little bit about uh, live events and, you know, appearances, things like that. Let's dig into that a little bit more. You know, it's, uh, you know, at all of the uh, bigger national events, they do have an autograph signing for the pros, and uh, so that's important. They participate there. They get your name out. Um, a lot of the shows, like some shows like Novi, you'll see some of the athletes show up and uh, and rep uh, aftermarket companies or or you know some of the OEs, and, and that's important. And again, obviously, good behavior. You know, such you know settings are are very important as well. Um, we've had some dealer open houses that you know race teams show up at and help promote uh, the brand uh, at, at, at a dealer that's asked them to stop by and interact with their customers as well. And those are all important things. I mean, it's, uh, you know, again, it's about, you know, sponsorships is about promoting a brand that you're, you know, you're going to use their products. You're going to promote those products in a positive manner. You're going to give that feedback back any way you can, and you're going to try to help uh, spread the word uh, with the existing customers and, and potentially new customers is what it's all about. Definitely, definitely. One thing actually that I experienced at the Novi Snow Show that uh, you know I think it's pretty important for people to be able to do is I I had uh, my MBRP shirt on and I think I had my MBRP hat on and for, for people who don't know MBRP is uh, one of my sponsors and you know I had I had the, one of their exhausts that I was carrying around and some hats and so many people stopped me to ask me questions about MBRP just because I had that stuff with me and I was giving away hats and, you know, tr trying to, to talk about their products a little bit more and pointing them like, Hey, you know, Jared Heshka, he's, you know, he's running the exhibit. He's just right over here. And, uh, that kind of stuff is pretty, pretty easy to do. I didn't have to do much work to wear the clothing, answer some questions and direct people in the, in the right spot. But I guarantee things like that is going to, that's going to lead to, to sales. I'm pretty sure I sold two exhausts that day, you know, to <laughs> just, just based off of random interactions. And you know, that extra effort is what we were talking about earlier. It didn't take you a lot of work to do that. And you're probably wearing some pretty cool looking swag at the same time and pointing people to a booth that they can, uh, they can do something about, uh, you know, a, a product purchase or at least some, you know, product information from the experts in that booth. And, and that's pretty cool. We, you know, we did the same thing at, uh, you know, you see a guy like a Tucker Hibbert, for example, walking around heydays and, uh, he made an appearance in several of his top sponsors booths and does some autograph work and interacts with people. And it's kind of cool to get him, see him get up off of a chair and walk over a sled and explain some things to people or, or tell them why he uses certain products. And, as he walks through that big event, uh, he is wearing all of his, uh, his, you know, his, his casual race attire. So people know who he is and what he represents and very approachable. Stop him, talk to him and realize that he puts his pants on the same way everybody else does in the morning and it goes a long ways towards, you know, helping, you know, create some interest in a product line. Mm -hmm. Certainly. One of the things that we try to encourage people to do uh, and this show is if you are at uh, a live event for whatever 
it may be, whether it's a race or, you know, a, a place where people are selling products at or a swap meet, whatever it may be. Uh, just don't, don't forget that you're probably representing somebody at that point as well. Or if you're not, that is a very good opportunity to make connections. So for example, when I went to the, my last arena cross race, I'm out there trying to get interviews with the racers. Like that's, that's one of the things that I do. I did watch the race and I did enjoy the race, but that's one of my intentions of going to these things. So don't uh, lose sight of the opportunities that live events can bring. Even if you're there for recreational purposes, you may also find that, that you know, it's, you can find some really good connections at that same moment. Oh, definitely. Definitely. Well, just like with me and you right at the, the Novi Snow Show, I mean, I had I had several people on my list that I was like, I need to stop and say hello to these people. And had I not stopped and said hello to you, we might not be here today uh, recording this podcast. Exactly. And again, as we said earlier, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's one thing to contact you know, each other via email or phone call, but it's nice to shake a guy's hand and look him in the face and remember that face when we're doing this conversation. It's uh, it just makes things a lot better. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, that's good. Um, what are some other athletes that you're impressed with? Like if a person's listening to this show and they are looking for an example, someone to model, someone to emulate, someone to study, who would you say are some of those athletes that are just doing really good at sponsorship? You know, in the arena that we really participate heavily ourselves in, Tucker Hibbert and his crew have done, besides being outstanding on the track, they kind of set the bar several years back for utilizing social media, um, getting quick updates out uh, to, to, you know, let people know all of their sponsors that may not be on site, uh, how they did on the weekend and, you know, what their plans are, what their goals are. And, and again, have a chance to promote their brand with uh, with their formal presentation. They were kind of some of the beginning guys that were promoting uh, a video every week of of you know the whole race team, kind of that the whole lifestyle of what goes on in the trailer and prepping sleds, you know, to the point of you know fuel for the body and walking the track and and what happens with some you know race shots from the track. And, you know, the rest of the racers have followed suit. And, you know, another good guy that does a great job of that is Scott Judnick with, you know, the Judnick Motorsports team. And uh, those guys have kind of followed suit and really stepped it up. So it's it's really become, you know, pretty business, big business. A lot of the, a lot of the you know, sponsors out there make that a mandatory thing that if you're going to rep their products, we, we'd like you to go the extra mile and, and, and help us out and do a good job for us. And, uh and show people what you're all about and, and why this product is important to use. So that's, uh, that's, those are a couple examples in, in that arena that make things really happen. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So if people are looking for some other examples, check out Tucker Hibbert and Scott Judnick. And if you're listening right now and you're not a snow cross racer or a snowmobiler at all, that's okay. I still, would recommend you check these folks out, see what they're doing. I think that there's a lot that UTV racers can learn from snowmobilers and jet ski racers can learn from motocross riders. There's, there's a lot out there that, that translates. So check those folks out and see what you can come back with. All right. Yeah. Well, next thing I want to do is dive into the main event. That's where we discuss mindset. And essentially when I have people on this show that are making decisions around sponsoring others. I want to try to bring out the human element because somebody has to actually review that resume and make a decision that could strongly impact, you know, another person's career. So that's really what I what I try to get at when I when I interview business owners on this show. So the first question then that I want to ask you around that topic is you know, what makes choosing the right athlete to sponsor difficult and why? It is tough. We have a lot of racers that reach out to us every year. We actually have a couple thousand active racers on our program, any place that it snows and, uh, and, and, and at various levels. Um, you know, one of the things that's most important is we have to set aside a budget every year for 
how much we can we can afford to help. It's uh, you know, in those years that Mother Nature helps us from a snow standpoint and our sales are higher, it's a little easier to dig a little deeper and, and, and make those decisions. But when you realize you have a limited amount of people that you can help, we look for people that, again, that we kind of started off earlier with is, uh, can they do the job for us? Can they be good people? Will they promote the brand? Will they, uh, will they, you know, act professionally and ethically, you know, while they're using our products and, uh, and where are they racing? Obviously, uh, it makes a, you know, it makes a different, big difference between the kind of exposure a guy in a local backyard grass drag might have versus a nationally televised event. And while I'm sure that the, you know, the, the financial uh, resources will be different for those levels because there is only so much that can go around at times. Um, you gotta, you gotta look for exposure as well. And, and, and again, on top of the exposure, make sure it's the right type of exposure for us. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's very good. Um, have you ever had to say no to somebody and it just felt bad? Like, have you gone through that? Oh yeah. I mean, there's people that are outstanding athletes and have great teams, but their expectations for me to get on board were, were bigger than I could possibly handle at the time. You know, with the, you know, the current sponsor load that we had, I just didn't have room for them. I mean, as much as we'd like to, um, to help everybody, it is controlled financially. At the end of the day, the company's got to be healthy and, and, and got to make things go. So it's, uh, we've had to say no more than we like in all honesty. And, uh, it's never easy to say no. I guess if there's a few times it has been fairly easy to say no, but <laughs> in, most, in, in most cases, we really feel bad when we have to say, Hey, we'd love to work with you, but you know, I just don't have the resources to get that done today. Right, right. I'm sure though that that gets offset by some really good things, right? When you get to say yes to somebody, maybe even over multiple years. You know, some of the best feelings. You know, we worked with some of the big names in the industry, obviously, which which is cool and fun. But uh, when you watch maybe a, a young, you know, junior racer or even a 120 kid that walks up to a booth and and says, "Hey, I really want to be a stud boy rider this year," and and tell them that can happen and we're going to make it work for you and maybe throw a hat at the kid and watch it, watch that face light up. Mm -hmm. That's pretty cool feeling. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. I know that's one of the more rewarding things for me in this podcast too, is although I share examples of people that reach out to me and I'm like, what, this is horrible. Uh, there's, there's lots of good examples where people give me feedback saying, yeah, you, you know, I use your advice from your show and I locked down my first sponsor or, you know, I took my program to the next level based off some advice from your guests, and that makes everything all worth it. So I'm assuming you run into some of the same, you know, emotional experiences uh, with sponsorship too. Oh, definitely, definitely. Cool. Well, uh, what would you say has been a big obstacle that you've had to overcome in, in motorsports? You know, for me personally, uh, because we're we're involved in motorsports you know, not only from a, from a brand and a, and a sponsorship standpoint, we also participate ourselves pretty heavily and we've raced, uh, you know, cross country, snow cross, and back in the day, some, you know, some drag racing and whatnot, but today we're still running a national, uh, snow cross team for Artie cat. And, uh, one of the hardest things for me has been being that guy that needs some help and some sponsorship. It's, uh, I get beat up pretty hard by almost every race, you know, organization out there and snowmobile club and, and, uh, anybody that's kind of affiliated with snowmobiling, um, for that proverbial handout, you know, and it's mm -hmm. been very difficult for me, even though we kind of know how the game was played and, and how to, you know, how to, how to weed our way through it. It's pretty hard for me to go out and ask for help ourselves at times because yeah. I mean, that's probably been my biggest obstacle is just not being willing to try to sell myself too hard to, to, to get help in return. Uh, that's a really good point. You know, we talk about this topic every now and then in the show where people feel bad almost asking for help. Uh, you know, I, people have sometimes feel like 
they don't want to reach out for a handout. Like, well, you know, another way of look at it is you are truly working in exchange for, you know, a discount or product or, you know, some financial support. You are working for that. So I don't want people to, to feel like that should hold them back, although it may be it may feel a little uncomfortable at first. You know, it's, there's a big difference, I guess, between blowing your own horn and making a proposal that's beneficial to both parties that are involved. And yeah. uh, so that's, I guess, that's one of the things I think is extremely important is keep the horn blow into a minimum. And, and let's talk about when you ask for sponsorship or we ask for sponsorship is what we're going to do, you know, to earn that because it, it's it. It's, it's not entitled. It's not required. It's it's, it's optional, and uh, I think it's very important that uh, that you know people can explain why we should should get that help or offer that help. Definitely. Yeah, for sure. Well, Ron, what do you think is next for you in motorsports? And and after you answer that, I mean, how do you know that's the right next thing? You know, at this stage of the game. Um, we came close to not racing this year. My oldest son, Zach, has uh, decided to retire a year ago after a pretty long snowcross career, and uh, he's still very active on our team. He helps drive the big rig and click wrenches all weekend uh, and, and do some tuning and run the guys to the lines with us and whatnot. And my middle son, Nick, has been very active in uh, in building a, a business for himself. He builds pretty crazy-looking uh Harley's. He uh, he's done a very good job getting a lot of national recognition there, building big wheels and performance uh, Harley Davidsons, and it's kind of affected his career. But uh, my hopes are is to continue racing as long as we can. It's been great uh, from a family standpoint. We spend a lot of time together as a family with uh, with the boys racing, and and uh, not only on race days but also doing all the preparation during the week and. I'd like to keep a team going. We now that we have other people on our team other than just family members, uh, we're running with Brett Nostal in the pro class this year, and Trent what we're uh, in a sport class, uh, and we've had a few other riders over the years. Um, that'd probably be the next direction is to make sure that we can continue to to, to put a team on the road every year and and be successful out there and have some fun doing it for a while. Uh, sounds good. Sounds good. All right. Next up is the finish line. That's where we kind of wrap up the show. And what I always ask people in closing is what's one solid piece of takeaway advice that people, if they ignore everything else, what's one thing that they should take away from this show? In sponsorship, make an attempt to give more than you take. Yeah. Well, there you go. That makes sense. Summed up nicely. Uh, you know, most people, honestly, they say a lot, a lot, a lot of words for that that one thing. So uh, give more than you take. I'm writing it down. Cool. Awesome. Well, what's the best way, Ron, for people listening to connect with you? You know, uh, we're still old-fashioned. We can pick up a phone and call Studboy uh, any day of the week. Uh, we do have a website at studboytraction.com. We're pretty active on uh, on Facebook and Instagram as well. We don't we don't typically take orders or race resumes there, but uh, you can reach out to us and we'll do our part to to make sure we uh, we get in contact with you as well. Perfect, perfect. All right, well, I really appreciate you taking some time to kind of share your story, you know, in uh, your motorsports career and going through a lot of the. The goods, the bads, uh, the things that people should be should be paying attention to in their motorsports career. So I really appreciate all that. And at this point, though, I am going to leave you with this. Have fun and ride safe. Well, cool. We appreciated the opportunity here, and uh, make sure you follow up with me. We got to get uh, that new Artie Cat of yours uh, trail worthy too. So give us a holler, and we can get something figured out there as well. That sounds awesome. You betcha. Thanks for tuning in to this episode of the Sponsored Rider Club Podcast. I hope you enjoyed it, and I hope you learned a thing or two from this show. Be sure that you subscribe so that you don't miss any of our upcoming guests. Specifically, we have our next guest, Josh Martelli, coming on from Mad Media. He's also COO of UTV Underground and, like, six other companies. It's pretty crazy. Uh, he's phenomenal. His brother, 
was on the show, Matt Martelli. He was on episode 31. After that, we have Tiffany Stone of Torque, and she's going to talk a little bit about preparing for interviews on the podiums or for podcast interviews, things like that. And then we have Jim Riley. Jim Riley is the owner of Baja United. He's an off-road racer, and he's a marketing mastermind. Please head over to iTunes and leave a rating and review. That would be phenomenal. It really helps the show gain exposures in the iTunes world. A special thanks for this episode goes out to our sponsors. We have Neverlift Racing Company, specifically the Armor Coat product line, then Solder Weld, Bold Racing Suspension, and TopThePodium.com. Make sure that you are following us on social media. We are on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter as the Sponsored Rider Club Podcast. Twitter is SRC Podcast. I look forward to serving you again next week. Until then, have fun and ride safe.